the real reason why he, the Apostle Paul, was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him. This is Claudius Lysias, is the he there. He's the, the, the tribune. He's a uh, military, military political figure. Uh, he unbound Paul and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet him. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him, Paul, to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and a resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledged them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, Claudius Lysias, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, this beautiful verse here, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. We'll stop there, and to all these wonderful words, all of God's people say, Amen. Well, we're in a part of the book of Acts, the end here, chapters 21 to the end, chapter 28, that really... Uh, give us a very striking contrast between a lot of the so-called gospel that's preached in our nation in our time versus the gospel and all the outcomes of it, the realities of believing the gospel that existed in the times of the apostles. Our Lord Jesus Christ again and again told his disciples and tells us uh, by extension, that uh, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Uh, that we are to take up our cross, just like our Lord did, and deny ourselves and follow Jesus. We are to suffer for Jesus' sake. We saw this back in uh, the early part of the book of Acts, in chapter 14, I believe it was, where the apostle was traveling through a various region of Asia Minor, uh, modern-day Turkey, and he told them that it was through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. You cannot name and claim your way out of trials and tribulations. You cannot avoid trials and tribulations. You cannot go under them. You cannot go around them. You have to go through them, the apostle said, in order to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that doesn't mean that every single Christian is going to suffer in every single way like the Apostle Paul, uh, that he would be mar eventually martyred, or, or the Apostle Peter who was crucified by, by tradition upside down in the city of Rome, or uh, like other great Christians like Cyprian's namesake, uh, Cyprian of Carthage, who was put to death in a, in a great theater by lions and by, uh, by a very violent, vicious death. But it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. That's not the American gospel, is it? We're not awake today, are we? Why are we not awake? Are we saying pretty good? Is that the gospel? Do we avoid, are, are we promised that we are going to avoid sickness? 
Are we promised in the Bible that we are going to avoid persecution? Are we promised health and, and wealth and prosperity? No. We're promised, just like the apostle here, we're promised that through the valley of the shadow of death, the Lord is with us and near to us. That's what we're promised, which is the greatest treasure, which is the greatest, we might say, wealth, and which is the greatest health possible because all, uh, 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 even though our bodies might be struck down with death, we will see Jesus Christ face to face. He will, he will glorify us in his presence. We will see him as he is. And so this part of the Apostle Paul's journey, like much of what we've seen before, it just brings a great striking contrast to us of, of a lot of what we assume is Christianity. A lot of what we hear is the good news. A lot of what people might promise or, or over-promise. But I guarantee you that, that those preachers who over-promise these sorts of things, they definitely under-deliver in this life. Our Lord Jesus Christ, though, never, never does that. His promises are sure. They're steadfast. They're real. They are true all the way to the end. You can take his word to the bank. Now, look at, the, look at this defense here. Uh, Paul has defended himself, first of all, before a crowd. That's what we see there, uh, that outline for following along, just a quick summary. Uh, Paul had been in the temple, the precinct of the temple. He had been there with four other Christians of uh, Jerusalem, and a mob had formed that was trying to kill him. They, they dragged him out of the temple. They closed the gate behind him. He was no longer permitted to enter the holy place. And I said last Sunday that it was ironically the Romans, the unclean, the Gentile, the Romans, the, the oppressor that saved Paul from his own fellow holy countrymen. So Paul was saved by the Romans, by this Claudius Lysias, this tribune of this uh, 1,000 soldiers strong garrison. And he was then able, and he was allowed to make his first defense of what he believed and why he was preaching the way he did. He called that uh, his apology, apologia, or a defense. And he did so before the crowd of the Jewish worshipers. We saw that last Sunday at the end of chapter 21 through the beginning of 22. Now it's the next day. Now it's the next day. Uh, there's great riots in the temple precincts, the temple court. The next day, we read there, verse 30, the end of chapter 22, uh, Claudius Lysias, this tribune, he would, as I mentioned, command a thousand soldiers. Uh, he was a, a military figure, but by the first century, he's also a very great political figure, uh, sort of like the chief of police in our time, right? The chief of police is not just a, a law enforcement officer uh, anymore. The chief of police is a politician, Chiefs of police uh, have to deal with politicians, they have to deal in a political way, they have to speak to the media, and a lot of times they want to run for office higher than chief of police. And so he was uh, a political figure as well. And we read that he wanted to know, he desired to know the real reason why Paul was being accused by the Jews. And so he commanded the council, the Sanhedrin it was called, uh, to meet. There at the end of verse 30. Now, I mentioned before the Sanhedrin, that was, uh, sometimes it's been called the Supreme Court uh, of the Jewish nation uh, in the first century and, uh, and before that and even beyond that. It was made up of two parties that we see and even in our story here, the Pharisee and the Sadducee party, or Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, and there were the chief priests, there were the scribes, the elders, the gospels call them that, the chief priests, scribes, and elders. And so there were chief priests, scribes, and elders who were Pharisees, and there were chief priests, scribes, and elders who were also Sadducees. And the high priest of the temple, he was the, he was the chairman. He was the head of that council uh, of Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court. And so he makes his apology. He makes his second defense here. And you probably notice it's a lot shorter than the, than, than the first one. The first one, he gave a great speech to the crowd. This one is a couple of lines. He was not allowed to go on in defense. But he says, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Now, he li he's, he's lived his life, he says, and 
uh, that the, the root of this, uh, this verb that he uses, it has a very political overtone. It means that you are a good citizen uh, of the polis or of the city. You are a Roman citizen. And so he's not bragging about himself here in any stretch. No, he's speaking of himself as a genuine servant of God. He genuinely served God, and he did so even as a good Roman citizen who was also just happened to be a Jewish Pharisee. So he, uh, he, he was a good citizen of both the Jewish Sanhedrin uh, as well as the Roman city of Antioch, uh, as we've seen before. Uh, now, kids, uh, you might see at times uh, on a report card or maybe you get some kind of a, of a conference with a teacher, whether it's online or in person, uh, and they might talk about your citizenship score. Do you even know what that even means anymore, kids? Citizenship. On our kids' report cards, they get a little citizenship, and it's a number. It's like, I think, one through one, two, three, or four, whatever it might be. What does it mean to be a good citizen? What's citizenship? It means, literally means that, you're a, that you've done good service to your country, uh, to your community, and in the, in the context of a classroom, in your classroom. You, you've been a good student. You've been a good friend. You've, uh, you've done your work diligently. You have kept your desk clean. If those of you who are homeschooled, you know, your mom and dad want you to keep that desk clean, right? Keep that room clean. Your room spills into your, the classroom. It spills into the living room. It spills into everywhere, doesn't it? Being a good citizen is keeping your pencils and your pens and your paper and your crayons and your colors and, and your books nice and tidy. That's to be a good to be a good orderly citizen. It's a Christian virtue to be a good citizen, uh, whether it's in class, whether it's in the community, whether it is to your country. And so Paul says that he was a good citizen. Uh, he, he, he lived his life as a good citizen. Uh, and when he said that, notice, the high priest Ananias commanded the person or those standing next to him to strike him on the mouth. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Well, I put a little note there for you. He became the high priest in the year 48. Uh, he had a reputation amongst the Jews as being a very violent man. He was untrustworthy. He was a taker of bribes, contrary to the law. Uh, he confiscated at times uh, the temple tithes, the money and, and the food and the animals and all the things that went to the temple that provided for the priests because they don't have their own plot of land and provided for the poor amongst the Israelites. Uh, he was also known as being very pro-Roman. The Talmud, uh, which is that great uh, collection of uh, the Jewish teachings over the many, many century, uh, centuries, it has a little phrase about Ananias, and it uses the words of Psalm 24. It's part of why I had us read that, read, that, uh, read that psalm this morning. Psalm 24. And in the Talmud, it says this about Ananias. Lift up your heads, O you gates. That's Psalm 24, isn't it? And let Ananias enter and fill his stomach with divine sacrifices. He would go there and literally take the food that was being offered up as sacrifice to God and as food for the priest. And there was also the peace offering that was also food for the person offering it. And he would take it for him. Self. Take it for himself. Strike him on the mouth. He wanted to show his, uh, his sort of credentials as being a, a holy and pious Jewish high priest, contrary to the, all the rumors and opinions and uh, reputation that he had, accure, uh, uh, that he had accrued over the, over the years. And he wanted to show somehow that he took seriously the law and the temple and the holy place although he frequently had his men go in and steal money and food and so forth. Strike him on the mouth, this, this unholy man who has blasphemed God. Now, Paul in response says this, uh, interestingly, God is going to strike you, you whitewash wall. I didn't look at the old King Jimmy this week, but uh, King James, that is. I call it the old King Jimmy, but uh, King James, I, 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 I'm pretty sure it says whitewash sepulcher or something like that. Uh, or at least that's, that's used elsewhere in the New Testament. What does it mean to say that uh, Ananias was a whitewashed wall? 
And where did the apostle get that phrase from? You whitewash wall. We have these white walls here, and I remember, uh, what was it, a year or two ago or whatever it was, they, they painted these walls. Uh, those of you who are here today, it's nice and, uh, it looks like it's going to be nice outside today. Uh, it's a nice, sunny San Diego summer Sunday. And, uh, but you're not going to be here probably because uh, when, you, when you go back home, if you're on vacation here, uh, eventually it's going to rain a little bit. It rained a little bit this past week. And to those of us who've been here long enough know what's going to happen when the rain hits those stained glass windows. What was that, George? They leak. <laughs> they leak. They leak. These walls didn't used to look this nicer, uh, uh, bright white. Uh, they were faded, and there was all kinds of water stains, yellow water stains, along uh, those walls, around those stained glass windows. And a lot of the, the wall there, a lot of the drywall, was uh, peeling off and cracking and falling off. So what they do in response? They took some, like, I don't know, what do you call it, spackle, or the little the stuff we put to patch up little holes. We, Sadie had to do it this summer in, the, in her room. She had to patch up all the little holes from all the nails and all the tacks that have accrued over the many years in that room, covered them all up nicely so that she can make uh, her room, uh, paint it, and then look nice. What do they do? Well, they put some patches over the holes, and they whitewashed these walls. Now, I don't, I'm, I don't want to scare anybody from running out. I don't know how strong those walls are, okay? I would think pretty strong. We have these big support beams. Uh, this looks like the ark, doesn't it? Uh, I think we're pretty strong. But what does it mean to be a whitewashed wall? It means to be structurally unsound. But you just covered up with some whitewash, right? Some white. It'd be like going to the U, a used car lot down on Oceanside, uh, or not uh, on the Coast Highway. There's, I don't know, there's only a couple left. Uh, Miranda, the Miranda's know way more than I do, but uh, at least when I moved here in 2000, uh, just lined with used car lots. And you would see a nice car once in a while. Wow, well, that thing, like nice, shiny paint job on that car. Uh, I think one of the car lots right now has, uh, has like a, an, old, an old Thunderbird. It's red, it looks really cool, it has white, uh, white wall tires. Uh, it looks cool, and I'm like, that thing, why would that thing be so, being sold on a used car lot with like three other cars? They painted it really, really nice. And if you open the trunk, what do you think you're going to find? You might find a dead body in there. I don't know. Um, you might find like holes in the bottom of the trunk because it's eaten out. It's rusted out. Maybe some water just flow. I don't know. It's probably not going to be the nicest car. The Elsa wouldn't be being sold on a used car lot in Oceanside, California. He was a whitewashed wall. That comes right from the prophecy of Ezekiel. I gave you the reference there. We'll just... Uh, well, I'll have you read that on your own, but in Ezekiel 13, this is, where, this is where that phrase comes from. Paul, as a Jewish rabbi, as a trained rabbi under Gamaliel, a Pharisee, he knew his Old Testament scrolls backwards and forwards, literally backwards and forwards, let's say you read Hebrew, backwards, backwards and forwards, at least from our vantage point. Uh, he knew that, and so the, he called him a structurally unsound wall that was just covered up with white paint. It looks nice on the outside, underneath. Right? As Jesus would say, whitewash sepulchre, dead men's bones. Dead men's bones. God is going to strike you. And Paul's words come true. In the year 66, the Jews burned the high priest's house, causing him to flee his own home. And he was found hiding in an aqueduct. Uh, and he was put to death. God is going to strike you. Now, Paul also defends himself. I didn't know that he was the high priest, and he cites there from Exodus chapter 22. You see that in verse number 5 of our story. Uh, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And he evidences his submission to the very laws of God that he was wrongly being accused of breaking. Right? That, that's, that's the big irony here. They thought they saw him with Trophimus, that, G, that Gentile from Asia, walking through the holy place. And that's why he defiled the temple. And they, they beat him. They dragged him unaccused uh, without any hearing. Uh, they close him off. Uh, and they try to put him to death. So much for thou shalt not murder. Right? But he shows his very submission to the law quoting there the law itself. You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And he goes on to defend himself. I am a Pharisee. I am a Pharisee. Uh, 
with respect, it, is, it is with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead, or, and the hope of the resurrection of the dead, that I'm on trial. Now that, that phrase there, the hope uh, and the resurrection of the dead, it's called a handiades in, uh, in syntactical terms, that these are the same thing. His hope is the resurrection. These aren't two different things, it's the same thing. I'm being put on trial here because I hope in the resurrection of the dead. And the resurrection was called the hope, which is a shorthand way of saying what the hope was, resurrection from the dead. Now, we see here something very interesting. We see here Paul's wisdom, his shrewd wisdom. He perceives, as he already knows, the Sanhedrin had two great groups. Those two groups were what again, or who again? Pharisees and Sadducees. And, and Luke even here gives a little parenthetical explanation of what they believe. He tells us that they had this disagreement, this dissension. The Sadducees say there's no resurrection. They don't believe in bodily resurrection. They don't believe in angels or spirits. The Pharisees accept them all. In fact, the Sadducees only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament. The Pharisees took the whole thing, right? The whole Tanakh, the entirety of the Old Testament, uh, the whole kit and caboodle, we might say. Now, the Sadducees only held to the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, because seemingly there's not much there about resurrection or angels. The prophets, of course, get into much more of that in the historical books. How can, you, how can you read the story of Elijah and not believe in a spirit realm, right, uh, for example? How can you not read uh, the prophets, the prophet Daniel, speaking of a resurrection, the last day, and so forth? So the, so the Sadducees cut off that part of the Old Testament. They took just the first five books. But that's why Jesus, in arguing with them in the gospel story, of course, he says that uh, the Bible, God describes himself saying, I am, present tense, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, meaning they are in God's presence. They're, they are in that spiritual realm. Their souls are already with God. And one day their bodies will be too. So Paul is very wise here. And, and he divides the body, we might say, in sort of parliamentarian terms. He divides the body and he sort of puts the ball back in their court. And he lets them tear themselves apart. They want to tear him apart. He lets them do it to themselves. Now, this resurrection, this resurrection, so, so important. Let's go back in uh, the book of Acts to a couple of texts just to remind ourselves that the resurrection was central to the Apostle Paul's preaching, central to the Apostle Paul's message. So chapter 13 at verse number 34, we're just going to read a couple of selected verses, but you can read the context on your own and, and see more. Here, Paul preaching in Antioch in Pisidia, or Pisidian Antioch. Uh, and he says, And as for the fact that he raised, meaning God, raised him, Jesus, from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he's spoken in this way, so on and so forth. The resurrection of the dead. Christ's resurrection, which he describes in other texts, is the reason why there is going to be a final, general resurrection of all people. Therefore, knowing that judgment is coming, resurrection and judgment, repent! Repent, turn to the Lord. Chapter 14, uh, or 17, excuse me, chapter 17, uh, at verse 31. 1731, uh, now speaking to uh, Gentiles to uh, Athenians, he says in 1731 uh, that very thing. He, he speaks about times of ignorance, verse 30, God's overlooked them, but now he commands all people to, everybody to repent. Why? Because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. How does Paul know that? Of this, he's given assurance to us, to all, by raising him from the dead. Christ's resurrection, the resurrection of everybody. Christ's resurrection from the dead, demonstrating the reality that there is going, that he's going to come back again a second time and resurrect everyone else and bring judgment. Therefore, repent. Repent of your sins. Turn away from yourself. Come back to God as today is the day of salvation. 
As today is the moment in which he's called you, he's saying. He says to us too. Jesus Christ is alive. God raised him from the dead. It is the most well-attested fact of the ancient world. Jesus of Nazareth, in fact, is the most well-attested figure of the ancient world. The manuscripts bear this out. Not just the, the, the manuscripts themselves of the New Testament, but Roman historians, Jewish historians, philosophers, and so forth. All accepted the fact that this Jesus lived and that he performed miracles, that he was crucified on a Roman cross, he was buried. Now, now, many of them accept the fact that he was raised from the dead. They don't accept the significance of that, though. They deny that it means anything. But yet, there are testimonies and evidences that he was raised outside the New Testament as well. He was raised. And God gave us that resurrection as an assurance to us that he's coming again. And until he comes again, live a life of repentance. Turn away from yourself and turn to him. Now, you can see that there's a few more verses there. But later on, we're going to come, we're going to come into these verses, chapter 24, 6, and 8, where Paul continually brings home this point of resurrection. It's for this hope of resurrection, Christ's and ours, that I'm being put on trial. The crowds, of course, begin to tear themselves apart. Uh, Claudius Lysias and the centurions, of course, weren't allowed to be in that room. Uh, no doubt they can hear the clamor. They can hear the chaos. Uh, we were watching the news a couple of nights ago, and uh, I think Cyprian was sitting there eating and said, hey, Sip, look, at, look what's going on in the news here. This is, what, this is what it's like to live in other countries. Uh, and it was, it was all these scenes from all these parliaments and all these congresses from almost every other country in the world where they're throwing chairs across the room at each other. You've probably seen that, right? It's not law and order. It's not nice and peace, peaceful and tidy. People are choking people out. They're, they're doing flying elbow drops from the dais and so forth. It looks like chaos. And no doubt Claudius Lysias can hear that chaos going on in this Supreme Court. And so he grabs him by force, brings him out, puts him in his barracks. And the next day, of course, we read that beautiful verse, verse 11. I'll come to that in just a moment. Uh, the story goes on, just for the sake of time, just to summarize the end of chapter 23. Uh, there was 40 men who plotted, took a vow. Uh, they plotted to kill the Apostle Paul. Uh, the plot was foiled, and so Claudius Lysias uh, takes several hundred of his centurions and uh, horsemen, spearmen, and he sends them uh, to the governor. Felix will come to him next Sunday. So Paul here defends himself, but most of all, he's defending his hope. He's defending the hope of the resurrection. But I want to make a few uh, concluding applications of all this, as well as uh, what we've seen from the Apostle Paul's life so far. Uh, and they're, they're, they are these. There's, there's three things I want to say. Uh, we read these defenses, we read these stories, we read the chaos, the, the persecution, the tribulations, the trials. What do we learn from this? What do we learn from the apostles' life? And what do we see God doing here, most of all? Well, first of all, there's this. When we read this defense in particular and the other ones all together, Paul's entire ministry, this is what you are to take away. Entrust your life to the loving providence of God Every moment of your day, in every area of your day. Entrust your life to the loving providence of God. His providence, his providence, his care, his concern, his love, his protection of us. Uh, there, there's no need to name and claim whatever it is you think you need. No, trust in the Lord. Rest in the hand of God, the almighty hand of God that upholds everything, that upholds everything. Entrust yourself to that hand. The book of Hebrews, some of you know I'm writing a commentary in the book of Hebrews, and the very beginning of Hebrews, it describes Jesus, or the Son of God, Jesus, uh, describes a reality that he upholds everything, the ages, literally, but the universe, the world, he upholds it all, not by his hand, but by the word of his power, his powerful word. Entrust yourself to that Savior, to that God, to that King. 
Because here's Paul, and uh, he's going on preaching. We've seen great fruit in his preaching. We've seen the glorious work of the gospel, saving sinners, spreading far and wide throughout the ancient world. But we see him every step of the way being tracked and traced and persecuted and put down and through many trials and tribulations. But yet he learned to entrust his life to this loving hand, this loving providence of God. Every moment, every day, in every single area of his life. Whether he was out preaching, whether he was in a prison cell, whether he stands before the crowd, whether he is now before this court, he gave himself to the providence of God. And whether he was there in the Uh, wanting to go into the Ephesian amphitheater before tens of thousands, or whether he's here in a barracks. He gave himself, he entrusted his life to the Lord, the loving hand of God. And remember, we've seen Paul, he's felt this compulsion in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's felt this leading from the guidance of the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And he's been told by the Holy Spirit, we saw a couple of chapters ago, he's been told that what awaits him there is persecution, is arrest. And eventually he learns he's going to get to Rome. But he entrusts himself in every step of the way, every moment of his day to the loving purposes and providence of God. Whether he was seeing sinners saved or whether he himself is being beaten to a pulp, he entrusted his life to God. Secondly, we learn from Paul's defense here and we learn from just his overall life in the book of Acts, be confident. Be confident that God has a plan and a purpose for the evil that befalls you. Be confident that God has a plan and a purpose for the evil that befalls you. Sometimes we talk about, you know, God, we hear, you know, well, God has a wonderful plan for your life. True. But we learn something else from the Apostle Paul's life. That God has a plan for the evil that befalls us, that that befell the Apostle. The Sanhedrin and these 40 men, they, they had a plan for Paul's life. It wasn't a good one. But God had another plan for him. And he was confident in that plan. Again, he he knew, the Holy Spirit said, when you go to Jerusalem, all that awaits you is, is persecution and pain. But he was so confident that even when churches like in Ephesus and we saw in Tyre and elsewhere, they were saying, Paul, don't go. Don't go. They know you're, if, if, if they know that you're coming, they are going to arrest you. I remember Paul said, well, you're breaking my heart. What are you doing? I'm willing to give my life for Jesus Christ. I am going. That's confidence. One writer said it like this, human plans cannot overrule the purpose of Jesus. Be confident, brothers and sisters. Be confident, Christian, that when evil comes in your life and our life as Christians, God has a plan for it and a purpose for it. Don't ever think that somehow somebody took God for surprise. You know, well, God didn't see that coming. I, you know, certainly I didn't, but God didn't see it coming either. Because you know, if God saw that coming, he wouldn't have let that happen to me. Really? You think that? I mentioned the, uh, the prophet Elijah earlier. I mean, do you realize what happened to the prophet Elijah? I mean, woe is me. You know, I'm the only guy. And I'm here down in the desert under a tree being fed by ravens. Don't ever think, you know, well, this can't happen to me. You know, my, my God would never let that happen to me. When you start a sentence with my God, you always know it's not the real God. God allows evil. God allows things to befall, even his own children, but always for good. Always for good. He's got a purpose for it. The purpose for Paul, of course, to get to Rome and preach the gospel. Third, embrace the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ with you 
in suffering. That verse number 11 uh, should stand out in our minds and in our hearts this morning. Uh, it's one of those just beautiful verses. The following night, there's Paul in a barracks. He's just tried to defend himself. His own countrymen at his heart's desire and, and prayer to God for them that they would be saved, they wanted to put him to death. And Paul says in Romans, of course, you know, I, I, I would wish that God would even curse me eternally to bring salvation to them. They wanted him dead. The Romans had to save him and put him in a barracks. Right? Sleep like on a cot somewhere. In those days, not the most comfy. The Lord stood by him. Notice that? The Lord stood by him. Take courage. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Where else in the Bible do we read the Lord stood by somebody? Do you know where? Everybody forgot all my wonderful sermons in Genesis. <laughs> sure, yeah, Joseph, Jacob, Jacob, okay, Daniel, right there. Didn't Daniel see four people in a, burning, in, a, in a burning furnace? I mean, the Lord stands by people. The Lord stands by us. Now, it's interesting, Luke, Luke is just stating it as a matter of fact. Of course, Jesus tells us more, more theologically correctly what that means. Uh, Jesus, of course, has ascended to the right hand of God, and his disciples, as he, as he was saying that, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. They were tearful, they were crying, they were, they were sad, they were despondent. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send you another comforter. One like me in my place, the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus stands by the apostle, how? In the power of the Holy Spirit. In the power of the word, notice. Take courage. For as you have testified the facts about me in, in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. So brothers and sisters, we read these stories, and they're full of lots of trials and tribulations, lots of, de lots of details, lots of events, lots of things that we may not even be able to, uh, 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 be able to uh, identify with in our own lives. And we might think that a little bit of sorrow and suffering in our life might you know, be so bad. But, loved ones, you do not need that phony American gospel of happiness and health, prosperity and position. You don't need that gospel. You don't need that gospel. You have Jesus Christ raised from the dead. He's Lord and King. It will not let anything happen to us apart from Him and His will for our lives. And so, entrust yourself to the providence of God every moment of your day. Trust that his plan for you and for even evil is perfect. And rest in his presence. The Lord is with us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bless you and praise you for the, the work that you did in the life of the apostle. It was all for your glory. It was all your purpose, all your plan. It was to bring the gospel even to the Romans. Even Caesar's house had people who believed. And we know that, Lord, in, in, in the mysterious providence of God, somehow in some way, from Paul's desire to preach to the Romans and to go to Spain, and the gospel has come and has reached us. It's found us. You have found us. And we know, Lord, there, there are so many more who need to hear of Jesus. Send us out, whether it's at work, may we know that we are being sent, whether it's at school, whether it's in our neighborhood, in our, uh, amongst our family, whether we are sent far and, far and wide away, but Lord, wherever we are, are, we are being sent by you to live in this joy and in this confidence that your providence is over all things, there's nothing that befalls us by chance. Your plan is perfect, pleasing to you, and we should know that it's, it should, it's also perfect for us. And most of all, Lord, we, we rest this morning in that wonderful promise of your presence. And as we come to the Lord's table, assure us, assure us, Lord, that 
that we are with you and you are with us and fill our hearts with a longing to see you face to face and to and to to be in your presence in every way in which we can understand that idea of presence to be with you to see you to touch to be held to have your very fingers wipe away every single tear from our eyes until then give us confidence and give us purpose to live our lives to your glory every day and to bring the gospel to those who need to be saved. And we ask it in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, amen.